our colleagues in different regions of the world. After the breakout rooms, we are returning back to the main space to listen to highlights from those conversations, and then we're going to close the event. Now, let's welcome our first guest speakers, Yasuyo Inoue from Japan. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Yasuyo Inoue. I'm from Japan and this is just after midnight. <laughs> so I'm just sleepy. So I'm not sure whether I can speak in the right English or not. Um, I think I should point out the um, big issues at libraries in Japan including privacy things. Um, during the, this COVID-19, still Japanese government wanted to open Olympic games this summer. It's kind of scaring for us, but um, anyway, they do. <laughs> anyway, um, for libraries, uh, that is a different story. Um, there are, several big issues like your country, but I wanted to point out two things. One is about the privacy things. Let me see, how can I move this second page here? Okay, okay. So um, as for the privacy things, um, I'm not sure exactly other countries, but in Japan, um, almost one year ago, uh, COVID-19 expanded and Japanese government uh, demanded public libraries, public museums and the public archives uh, to keep record of the visitors uh, information. And government said that when uh, government or local uh, centers on healthcare ask to provide libraries, museums, archives, uh, must open business personal information to those centers. So the uh, librarians, public librarians especially, are really upset. Uh, why public libraries or public museums, public archives must keep the user's records? you know, the cafes or bookstores, there are many people visit those places. Uh, not only one year ago, still they are open, but no other places ask, asked by the government to keep record who comes to that cafe and uh, how long they stay, something like that. Uh, government said they wanted to keep record to make a database, it called COCOA. And when you check your iPhone, uh, maybe you uh, had the experience to get contact to the patient or something like that. So that is a really good database, but uh, government asked only public libraries mainly because museums and archives are closed so they only asked mainly to the public library to keep the user's record. So we uh, public librarians worry that how do those centers use that record? Because the, the center on public health is not the police or political authorities, but nobody knows how they use those uh, private information, who visit the library and what they rent, how long they stay at the library, something like that. So that's kind of a scary. So um, public librarians ask the Japan Library Association, especially Intellectual Freedom Committee of Japan Library Association. And the Intellectual Freedom Committee set up the guideline how to react 
uh, to that authorities. And the Intellectual Freedom Committee uh, made a statement, we do not recommend collecting digital records uh, because of the uh, intellectual freedom statement in 1979, uh, one of the principle is to keep um, personal record who visited the public library, uh, what they rent from that library, so, so and so. So, um, they made such kind of guideline. So um, they are all Japanese, but if you are interested in that, just uh, look at it. But um, sadly, not like in the United States or maybe other countries, not all public libraries hire professional librarians in my country. Um, maybe one or two, but most of them are not trained as librarians. They are, seems like a public offices. So <clears throat> when they are demanded by the government, they think that they must, they must follow what the government said. So it's not the librarian's way. So the uh, Japan Library Association made a guideline and also recently, uh, made a checklist um, to check before you uh, follow what the local government or national government say. It's a, it's a kind of the training or education. So, you know, even librarians need to brush up their knowledge or attitude or philosophy all the time. But more than that, you know, the library staffs who have no experience or who have no educational background to be a librarian, they need to be trained, especially not only this pandemic, but also natural disaster, how uh, public librarians react in those situations. So that's very important things. And that is not only in Japan, but also other countries, you need to be you need to train uh, non-professional library staffs to prepare or how to react. I think so. And the, this is what uh, among the statements said, uh, as I said, 1979, there's a library freedom declaration devised and added uh, libraries or librarians uh, need to protect uh, visitors' uh, record as a kind of privacy information. Uh, that's why uh, JRA or Intellectual Freedom People, uh, based on this uh, declaration, uh, set up the guideline and a checklist, and even non professionals should read and understand how to react um, as a librarian under this uh, pandemic situation. And also another big issue, it sounds like a very different from privacy, but it's a very uh, big issue at the public libraries in Japan, uh, that the copyright law reform uh, I think the other countries also, uh, because of the Marrakesh Treaty ratification, uh, Japanese government also ratified that the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, because of that, uh, copyright law was changed uh, 2019. And because of that changing, now um, the government set up the new act. It's so long, I cannot translate into English. Uh, we call that Reading Barrier Free Act. It's a short one. Uh, everyone, especially disabled people, has a right to access to the information. So what we can do for them? So especially the libraries, now we are discussing a lot. We already have the guideline, but um, it is not so clear. So just 
uh, last month, another copyright law was reformed. And the, now we are just wondering how we can do uh, services to the disabled people or children, especially because um, same as your country, children cannot go to school sometimes. Now in Japan, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, they go to school. Um, college and universities are really questionable. Like today in Osaka, the west side of Japan, the government, governor uh, declared that at college or universities don't have the class. You must change to the online classes, something like that, because the number of the patient has been decreasing drastically within two days, um, five times more. Anyway, um, uh, those copyright law changed. Um, most of them focus on that, um, how to send books or materials via internet. Um, in other countries, some countries, ebooks renting is expanding, but here in Japan, uh, ebook lending is not so uh, big service, especially at public libraries. The reason why is one is uh, most of the ebooks are manga. 80% of the ebooks are manga books. So public librarians and school librarians are not happy to provide the e-manga. <laughs> I, I don't know other countries, but the no <laughs> librarians are not so happy to have the manga books at, at libraries. Um, so maybe 20, 25 percent of the ebooks. Maybe we can provide at the libraries that librarian said, but not so many. So uh, because of this pandemic, many people face trouble to go to the public library and to get books. So government decided to change the law and try to persuade the publishers and to publish good ebooks. <laughs> which our librarians want to get and provide to the people. But before that, uh, copyright law needed to be changed. So the, um, it's a big discussion. Public libraries, because of the old copyright law and the public library law, we can provide uh, materials free, but it does not say school libraries or academic libraries can do same way. So it is really, it's not clear uh, whether except the public libraries, school libraries, academic library can do the same way to provide eBooks or not. So now still we are uh, discussing a big especially the children, they need to get e-materials, uh, even though they will get the tablet by each person within a few years, and they can do the online classes, elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids, they can do online classes because government give the tablet to each kid, but there's no e-books for kids, so that's the problem. So um, because of this copyright law, um, not only legal things, but also how public library um, can provide the good service to the people, to the children or disabled people, something like that. So now the change has been changed a little bit. So now how librarians react to that changing. So 
um, this is a really, really a uh, short presentation. Maybe I will get the answers, uh, questions from you. Uh, this is adding to that. Maybe you have the same thing that the posters, uh, you can get uh, copyright free from the web. One of the publisher provides the posters for small children. Uh, they are all hiragana. So even the six years old kids can read those easy Japanese and follow uh, to put the masks or to stand here and making kind of social distance, something like that. So that is good for the foreigners who live in Japan, who face troubles to read a very difficult Chinese letter Japanese, but most of them can read this easy Japanese. So it's good for uh, children and the foreigners in Japan. So maybe you can use uh, at your library if you have the um, foreigners, <laughs> Japanese foreigners. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> so Thank I, you. Should I? Thank you so much, Yasuyo. Um, you have shared very interesting insight on the um, Japanese way of looking at privacy that includes not only what we might think is, you know, regular, but there are many aspects to it. Uh, the access to ebooks, the copyright, the libraries, posters, news. So uh, thank you so much. This is very comprehensive in terms of uh, uh, having a kind of like a picture, a look, an overview into the Japanese uh, situation and the libraries. And it is beautiful because each country is different. So I'm not saying the, the situations are beautiful, but the, to understand uh, the diversity, why diversity of our world. I would like to invite uh, anyone that has questions to put them on the chat. Um, and Yasuyu is being so kind to be with us uh, when it's uh, past midnight in Japan. And she's going to go soon because she's teaching at the library school very early tomorrow. But if we have questions for her, this is the time. We're going to wait maybe uh, a minute if there are questions for Yasuyu. Um, I want to express my gratitude for dedicating uh, time <laughs> from your sleep to us. Uh, this is very interesting, uh, Yasuyu. Thank you so much. And if there are no questions, then we will um, go to the next speaker. Uh, and this is Fiona Bradley. I want to remind everyone that the recording of this event will be available uh, later, perhaps next week. So thank you so much, Yasuyu. Thank you. And we are going to, um, yeah, let's just wait for, okay, perfect. Now we'll share the screen with a presentation from Fiona Bradley. It's very important that we include voices from different parts of the world. And right now, Australia is still sleeping. So we have a beautiful video on privacy from Fiona Bradley. I want to mention that both Yasuyu and Fiona Bradley are very active within IFLA, Free Access to Information and Freedom of Expression Committee. So they are experts and we are just fortunate to have them with us today. I will share my screen with, um, I'm hoping I can share this screen. Okay, let's see. I just need a second to make sure the video is there. Okay, I'll start now again. Okay, perfect. And let me know if you hear it, please. Hello everyone, my name is Fiona and I'm joining you today from the land of the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land in this part of Sydney, Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to Indigenous and First Nations people watching this webinar today. 
feels as though every week a new service, a new technology or a disruption causes us to reflect on our policies and professional values as librarians. So privacy is one of the rights that we have historically safeguarded in our profession, but it is continually under challenge due to technological change and changing expectations. So I'm going to briefly cover some of these issues in my talk and talk a little bit about how librarians are responding. So depending on where you are in the world right now, you were probably introduced to the concept of library privacy in terms of print books. So librarians took seriously the idea that what you read should be known only to you. And in some countries, but definitely not all, if law enforcement wanted to find out what somebody read, you would not be able to tell them. In Australia, for example, most librarians are aware of IFLA's guidelines on intellectual freedom of privacy, which have been implemented in part in ALIA's guidelines, which is our national association. Typically, Australian librarians might also be aware of the ALA Bill of Rights in the US. But even in these two examples, there is great divergence between policies and what can seem like universal values that we share as librarians very quickly become subject to national laws and approaches to privacy. In the digital era, these differences have only become more pronounced as different countries implement new laws and we do not have control over what is collected when patrons use our services. So I think it's very important to think about these issues at two levels. Firstly, what do we need to do collectively, for example, in our associations and our consortia, and also in our institutions? And secondly, how do we support each of our patrons when they come to use our services to protect their privacy? Firstly, collectively, it's really important to keep privacy on the agenda. Uh, the very basic position um, that librarians hold is based in human rights. Individuals must have confidence that their privacy is protected in order to fully exercise their other rights. As you can see here, uh, for example, ALA has made statements about the importance of privacy for free speech, free thought and free association. And other researchers have also said the same, saying that privacy is essential because it guarantees intellectual privacy and the freedom to think. However, recently there have been many changes to privacy laws around the world that we need to pay attention to. Uh, in Australia, for example, it's proposed that there will be amendments to our federal privacy law later this year. But there are lots of other changes that impact privacy as well. For example, this week, there was a proposal from the Australian government that users should be required to provide identification, such as a passport or a driver's license, to be able to open a Facebook or a Twitter account to combat online abuse and harassment. But research by Emily van der Nagel and others have shown that real name policies don't change abusive behaviour, but they in fact create barriers for people that need anonymity to participate online. In Europe, the approach has been different, uh, where the general data protection regulations are committed to privacy by design. This is a key change in how we should think about systems and resources. Typically, library think, libraries think about ways that we can reduce the data that we collect about patrons, such as their phone numbers and their addresses. But privacy by design also challenges us to think about ways to safeguard patron privacy throughout all of our systems in terms of not retaining what they search for, what they click through to, and what they save. As a result of all these changes, we really need to keep our library privacy policies updated to reflect the impact of new technologies and strengthen the conditions in our licenses with vendors to reduce the amount of information retained by other companies. So it's important to push our vendors to be more transparent about what information they collect about our patrons and to pay close attention, for example, to new authentication initiatives that may be uh, passing more information about our patrons through to publishers and other vendors. This matters because even if you opt out from personalization yourself uh, or don't have a personalized account, enough of your activity may be tracked in the aggregate to be able to identify who you are based on your search patterns or your basic demographics and profile. 
So it's important that patients are informed about what data is collected about them when they use services that they access through the library. As librarians, we also need to be careful about how we collect and use personal data to make claims about the impact of library services. So for example, making claims about how library usage contributes to outcomes has become very widespread, but collecting data in this way may risk the library's reputation as a trusted and safe place if patrons don't have a meaningful opportunity to opt out or if in some way if that data is mishandled. Secondly, we need to support our patrons to help them understand what decisions they can personally make, but also be very clear with them that it's not just an individual responsibility, that governments and companies make decisions that, that also impact their privacy. So while privacy is an individual right, it involves very real systemic challenges. Many have suggested that people no longer care about privacy given how much information they might give to their supermarket or platforms like Facebook. Uh, but when people know that their privacy has been or could be impacted, they actually do behave differently. For example, several countries launched apps to track people's movements during the COVID-19 pandemic and to be able to notify them if they had somehow come into contact with an infected person. But each of these apps, no matter what country they were based in, actually failed. So from Australia to Singapore to the UK, it turned out that citizens actually didn't trust their governments enough to sufficiently track and hold such data to protect their privacy. In contrast to the apps that were seeking to track where people were and how long they stood next to other people, um, some other apps have been more successful. For example, in the state where I live, um, there is an app that you need to use every time you check in to visit a library, a cafe, a sports centre or a cinema. It's been a little bit more successful than the other type of app, not only because it is uh, mandatory, but because visiting a venue is a more active choice than just happening to stand next to someone um, in the supermarket. There are also published guidelines about how that data is collected, how it should be securely held and also how it needs to be destroyed after 28 days. Um, to support libraries in this process, Ali have published guidelines on how libraries should also manage this contract, um, this contact tracing data as well. So in the US, the Library Freedom Institute has been doing a fabulous job training librarians who in turn support their patrons to understand concepts like anonymization, encryption and online harassment. IFLA has worked, previously worked with Tactical Tech to promote their digital detox kit, which anyone can work through online. Here in Australia, academic libraries have developed a digital dexterity framework, which includes competencies in digital identity and wellbeing, so that library patrons can manage their own digital reputation. All of these initiatives are fantastic and we need more of them. Locally at my library, we also decided to form a patron privacy working group to discuss all of these issues and changes that we see in the landscape and to take action where we can. So there's so much more to this privacy topic than I could possibly cover in 10 minutes. Uh, but if there's really one thing I would like to leave you with and to challenge you to do, it would be to organise a discussion with your colleagues about your current library privacy policy, to take steps to make sure that it is up to date and aligned with um, local laws and also um, current library practices, and also to take steps to provide as much guidance as you can to users to help them to make meaningful and informed decisions about their privacy when they use library services. Thanks very much. Thank you so much to um, Fiona Bradley for sharing this information with us. Um, something that struck me from her presentation is the need for libraries to develop their privacy working group and to make sure they monitor these privacy uh, measures and the different procedures. And then there is another uh, aspect that she mentioned it's important that librarians are watching developments related to uh, get full text research, right? Because that can um, help to reduce uh, friction between discovery and access. 
through linking data service. And so those are uh, different aspects from privacy that we all have to be uh, aware of in all types of libraries, academic, public, school libraries. So thank you so much uh, to Fiona. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our third speaker. Uh, guest speaker is Patty Wan. Uh, she is the ALA uh, president-elect and also a director of Santa Monica Public Library on uh, broadband as a human right. Welcome, Patty. Thank you, Loida. Um, is my sound okay? I just wanted to double check. Uh, thank you for that warm greeting and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, libraries extend uh, necessarily life, necessary lifelines to community members facing job losses, healthcare crisis, and remote work and learning during an unprecedented and uncertain time. In America, there are more than 16,500 libraries. They are essential nodes to our nation's digital safety, connecting people with free access to computers and the internet, lending internet hotspots and devices, and providing digital literacy training and expansive learning and enrichment digital collections for all ages. As we know, broadband is, an es is essential for life tasks, including education, workforce, healthcare, and is a fundamental element of an inclusive and sustainable world. With COVID-19, we've been exposed to a digital deep divide. Libraries of all types continue efforts to respond to an uptick in digital demand and digital literacy resources, which promise to be long-term. As I think Lloyda mentioned earlier, we're in the pandemic and some people think it's over, but it's far from over. There's lots of exposure for libraries in our community. And many, of course, face budget restrictions. The inability to provide in-person library services during the pandemic magnifies inequities for people around the world without the equipment and the capacity to access and the confidence and skills to effectively use broadband and acquire digital literacy. An increasing number of information resources, including government resources and services are available solely online. Communities of color, low-income residents, rural, indigenous, older persons, people with disabilities and people experiencing homelessness are more likely to be without a strong connection to the internet and without the equipment and skills to access reliable resources. According to a current study from the FCC, and that was September, 2020, nearly 80 million people in the US do not have adequate broadband at home. This report fosters an understanding and consensus across the library community that the lack of high capacity Internet access is a serious problem that negatively impacts rural, urban, and suburban communities alike. Therefore, um, at the January 20, uh, 25th, 2021 um, meeting at, at ALA Midwinter, ALA affirmed the following. Universal access to affordable high capacity broadband is as essential as electricity and therefore a basic right for all. The association advocates for legislative and regulatory policies through which libraries can affect positive change towards such universal access. That was an affirming statement from our association um, council that we distributed to all members and has had significant consequence and, and, and serious deliberation um, across our association and, and with its members. Um, the pandemic has exposed the level to which Americans rely on libraries to access the internet and learn to navigate it, to find jobs, to gain new skills, to learn to read and identify what information to trust, as we heard earlier, and to become actively engaged in their communities. At the same time, COVID-19 has forced many states and local governments to implement cuts and furloughs that threaten the very services that communities are relying on for relief. A recent study from the Deutsche Bank called America's Racial Gap and Big Tech's Closing Window showed that 76% of the nation's black residents and 62% of the Latinx residents are slated to be shut out of 
or underprepared for 86% of US jobs by 2045. They are experiencing a racial tech gap that threatens their future economic mobility. The researchers observe that Black and Latinx households are a decade behind white households in broadband access. The study states, if this digital racial gap is not addressed in one generation alone, digitization could render the country's minorities into an unemployment abyss. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic continues and schools continue to adapt to in-school or hybrid and remote learning, students and educators lacking internet access are at great disadvantage or worse, shut out of teaching and learning. According to a recent study, 12 million K-12 students continue to lack the internet connectivity at home needed to complete schoolwork nearly a year into this pandemic. And some students actually disappear completely off the map. They are caught in the cruelest aspect of the digital divide, the homework gap, because they are unable to participate in online learning, after school enrichment, and programs that help address loss of opportunities to learn during this difficult time. A disproportionate number of students lacking internet access are black, brown, or indigenous. They come from low-income households and rural areas. So our libraries actually need to fill that gap and we need resources in order, in order to do so. The Association's Committee on Legislation identified broadband as a priority at its 2021 um, legislative agenda. ALA has endorsed legislation promoting broadband access, including um, low-income Black, Indigenous, people of color, households, and families with school-aged children and lack home internet access. As we know, ALA signed the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, the library pledge to promote digital inclusion, recognizing that universal connectivity requires collective collaborative efforts from all stakeholders across all levels of government. ALA continues to tirelessly work behind the scenes to secure federal support for libraries and librarians. What we know to be true is that the current administration is actually advocating for $100 billion in infrastructure uh, for high-speed and affordable broadband. Local libraries, regional libraries, state libraries need to take advantage of that infrastructure and bring that home to our own libraries to build resources uh, for stronger internet support. As a, as a professional association, we know that transformative library services rely on the library workers who offer them. And we will continue to advocate for legislative and regulatory policies through which libraries can, pos can affect positive change through digital inclusion for all today and in the future. I have a lot of examples of how library workers have made the difference digitally, but I know that we, we can share many stories. I think one of the things that I did wanna bring up today that I heard is that not only, this is not a US issue, this is an international issue, of course. Um, one of the things that I hope is that we will attract our local government entities to actually add Okay, for stronger internet access, but especially at the library level where we can make a strong impact for all of the communities that do not have strong access. We need to reach out to the FCC. We need to think about broadband as an equity issue. It's one of the platforms in my presidential um, platform as we, as we come about. Digital universal access is, is a right that everyone should expect to receive. It is as critical as electricity and water. Um, I think more importantly, I think one of the things that I heard from our speakers this morning is that from an international focus, as we uh, bring about stronger internet access for all, as we advocate for digital equity, we also need to safeguard privacy. We need to make sure that our, our, um, our records are secure, that, uh, that privacy is indeed as essential as, as electricity and water, it is a right that we should expect. And we need to employ our, our, our governmental access and our local regional access to make sure that we include that, perhaps doing privacy audits as, as our last speaker, Fiona, um, advocated. 
because we are we could be barriers to participation as well. So libraries need to safeguard both of those aspects to provide the access, but also to, to safeguard privacy and confidentiality. And we need to be remembered as trusted and safe institutions. Um, I wanna thank you for this opportunity, Loida, for inviting me to come and speak to you. And, and um, I hope that all of us can work together towards equity, digital equity for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, we have the president-elect of ALA here, and we have now questions, uh, uh, time for questions for her. So we are happy if you uh, write your questions on the chat box. This is a great time. I hope we have questions there. Um, I wanted to highlight something that Patty mentioned. Uh, it, is, it is the fact that it is alarming the lack of connectivity uh, that uh, is impacting, significantly impacting vulnerable populations and people of color. Um, and this is not only here in the States, but it goes for everywhere in the world. And there are many regions of the world, uh, so-called the South-South, as per uh, United Nations and other bodies, where uh, they are still in transition to development and that uh, we need to continue advocating for connectivity in those places. And I'm glad that librarians everywhere are committed to that. Um, and um, Patty also mentions that, uh, Patty, why don't you uh, say that, <laughs> your comment? We need audio. Ah. Yes, no, I got it. Thank you, Loida. You know, um, the, the, the digital divide is even more pronounced now. As we have seen um, through the pandemic, access to internet, access to equipment, access to hotspots, access to reliable, low cost. That's the other thing. It needs to be affordable. Um, uh, it needs to be reliable. Our standards are very low in the United States for what we consider robust internet access. Um, and it can be, uh, you know, the, the, the digital divide is even accented even more with, with most of our, uh, most of the, the children that are experiencing lack of access in the home that our students that need that access are black, brown, and low income. Um, it, is, it is incredible, um, you know, in, in looking at the statistics that are verified by Deutsche Bank, uh, by the FCC even, really, that 80 million people in the United States do not have adequate broadband at home. For those of us that, that rely, we know that we use broadband every day. We use it to apply for jobs. We use it to access healthcare. Um, many people still rely on telemed and telehealth, which means they get that health education by the telephone because they don't have any, any access to internet. And they actually go many times to their public library actually to access that information. Um, and so as we're experiencing um, uh, economic downturn because of COVID and libraries are being cut and reduced in terms of resources everywhere, um, or there's a strain and a tension on the budget. Um, it is more imperative more than ever that we all work together. I encourage all of you actually to become involved in the public libraries in the US, please. And, and of course, internationally, if this exists, please get involved in your internet consortia locally. They are trying to make a difference in terms of gathering um, internet service providers, um, nonprofits that are working in advocacy in this area, and libraries across um, the, the region to actually advocate for stronger internet access locals. Um, that way we don't, you know, part of the problem also is regulation. Um, and so we need to advocate with our FCC and with other agencies who are actually looking at monitoring the process um, to make sure that we have a structure that is equitable, um, that is, is reliable, that is low cost and thinks about broadband um, at, at really as a human right, um, as a right that everyone needs in order to be successful in this country and actually internationally. I think one of the things that we've heard today is that all of our colleagues across the country are also worried about this issue 
and and um, and we need to support one another. I think we're hoping that our statement at ALA actually can take flight and um, move internationally because it is something that will bring not all all of us together, but it it is it is in, invariably um, enable success um, and well being uh, within within each of our communities. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, definitely, we uh, are in sync, and efforts from ALA and from IFLA are being directed to the same goal to increase connectivity, um, digital equality. Uh, so thank you so much. Now we will um, move to the part about uh, building trust in information, and I will share my screen. This is where I'm going to speak about building trust in information, which means that I will speak about fake news or misinformation. And so, as you can see, today's topics for Together From Home Brave Librarians are another set of topics that are of concern and of interest to librarians everywhere, privacy, broadband, as um, human rights, and uh, this uh, widespread misinformation during COVID-19 times. Librarians can make a difference by helping patrons build trust in information and identify misinformation. As we know, if, if someone can't hear me, please text me. As we know, on one hand, Librarians have fought misinformation for centuries by providing access to information to facts. On the other hand, misinformation is not a new thing. It is an old problem. Therefore, devising ways to educate consumers of all ages inside and outside of formal education settings is important and it cannot be limited to people from certain groups or beliefs. Why librarians? Our job is to navigate the world of information, help community members, scholars, and students get what they need. They face their own technological disruptions and have responded by developing a set of principles to help their public access the credibility of information and use it ethically. Therefore, libraries have a central role in this matter. We educate our patrons about how to access information, how to understand that information, and how to use it. We have all heard about that magic potion that can cure the coronavirus and have seen posts about people not believing the virus is deadly or in the use of masks, face masks, or that people should get vaccinated. Fake news have been everywhere during the pandemic, but we can use our libraries digital resources to help people identify and build trust in information. Librarians are amazing. Even though when libraries might be closed, we can still connect with our library patrons to share media literacy resources on your website and social media channels. Here we have an example of another public library. This one is Los Angeles Public Libraries. It's a very good example of this. And they have information in English and Spanish. This might be a challenge, though simply telling people to doubt what they are reading is not enough. We must share principles of verifiability to identify reliable information. 
Olivia Ivy, a public affairs librarian and specialist on information literacy, says that information literacy helps students to pay attention to the source of information. Success, she says, is when a student inquires, says who, based on what authority, what evidence, an outstanding practitioner goes further and refutes inaccurate information. IFLA has taken the lead stating that libraries are fighting this so-called fake news, alternative facts, misinformation, post-truth. This continues to be a critical time. Remember that the Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth as the word of the year in 2016. IFLA has produced a COVID-19 edition of their popular How to Spot Fake News infographic, with a stronger emphasis on some of the issues encountered, encountered during the pandemic, especially the need to check with other sources. And in recognition of the fact that much news today spread through conversations and social media, and it is translated in at least 18 languages. Let's take a look at the infographic. These recommendations are good for librarians to help our library patrons, and we can post them for library patrons to be aware on how to spot fake news. We can post uh, the, the, the flyer on the library. So consider the source. Is there an author? Check their credentials on, on relevant issues. What are their supporting sources? Click on links and check official sources. Is it a joke? If the information is too outlandish, it might be satire. Research the source. Read beyond the headlines. Make sure to read the entire story. Do others agree with the story? Are other sites reporting on that story? What are the, source, the sources they're citing? Check your biases and consider if your own beliefs or concerns would affect your judgment. Look before you share. Don't share posts or stories that you haven't checked out first. And finally, ask the experts, ask the librarian, or consult a fact-checking site or an official site like the World Health Organization. What resources can help you and your patrons as you navigate all the coronavirus news? Well, first we have this resource that I just shared from IFLA and other resources include SNOPE. It's established in 1994, is the oldest and largest fact-checking um, site online. In their report, the coronavirus collection fact-checking COVID-19, the website's investigators looked into all sorts of conspiracy theories and fake treatments and more to dispel them. NewsGuard, NewsGuard's journalists rate the more, um, the more than 4,000 websites responsible for approximately 95% of the news and information consumed and shared online in the US, France, Germany, Italy, and the UK. Their coronavirus misinformation tracking center lists dozens of websites they have identified as publishing false information about the virus. Now we have our uh, next centers for disease control in the US are called uh, CDC and um, World Health Organization uh, that we know as the WHO. So the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the page Share Facts About COVID-19 is an excellent resource. They also have a Frequently Asked Questions page that we have on screen. The WHO uh, has a very useful and downloadable myth busters to dispel any rumors about the coronavirus. And uh, next we have civic online reasoning. Who's behind the information? What's the evidence? 
What do other sources say? These are questions posed as part of the Stanford History Education Group's online civic reasoning curriculum. And they have a myriad of free lesson plans. And for example, this one here about news versus opinions, they are free. And lastly, ALA has created a page with many resources uh, to help librarians and patrons entitled Libraries Respond, Combating Xenophobia and Fake News in Light of COVID-19, with resources for learning the facts about the virus and information about racism and xenophobia related to the coronavirus. Um, it also includes a very useful article uh, by Sarah Otsman that I have used for this presentation. And before I end this section, I need to also mention that the constant news and posts on social media of the, about the coronavirus can be exhausting. So experts recommend looking at trusted sources only a few times per day and avoid looking at social media on our phones constantly. Um, they say that we can try to do that and read a book instead. So can we do that? As we can see, the solution includes helping library users determine what they are going to trust. And I agree with Meredith Farfas. Uh, being able to make the right decisions about information sources is both a skill and a habit of mind, one that requires practice to develop. Libraries can strengthen communities by supporting our patrons in becoming knowledgeable information consumers. So let's continue uh, the conversation about this topic and how we can build trust in information to help our communities. We'll see if there are um, any questions. I want to again thank our speakers, Yasuyu Inoue, Fiona Bradley, Patty Wong, uh, for sharing also information uh, so far. Um, if there are no questions, now we're going to the breakout rooms. These are very interactive conversations about our future. Um, and hopefully we can use the, uh, your uh, conversation, the highlights to plan ahead. And we have uh, great moderators and now Edwin, our uh, webmaster from Reforma has put on the screen breakout room. You are free to join academic, public, school, or library associations. These are great to know more about what's happening in other countries. And last time they worked wonderfully, and now we're going to break and go into the breakout room. Hello, everyone. We're back. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Oh, fantastic. So we are uh, way over time, but um, it looks like we had really good conversations. So uh, we're going to go straight into the highlights and I'm going to ask the moderators to be uh, concise, very concise. Uh, this will be available, uh, the highlights part on the recording as well. And so I'm going to ask uh, Claudia to start with the highlights from the academic conversation. Um, yes, hi everyone. Uh, so we were a small group. Uh, it was Maria Simovic from Croatia and Tia Ward from the United States. Um, and it was, but it was a very good conversation that uh, fed in, uh, that uh, get, got energy from the previous uh, discussion. The privacy uh, topic was quite, uh, made an impact on all of us. Um, I will share briefly the, the ideas that we wanted to, um, to give us uh, food for thought for future library profession in the next years. So the privacy of the users and an updated library uh, uh, privacy policy remains uh, important as we learn today. And thank you to all the speakers. Also uh, remembering that libraries are also physical and there are a lot of physical tools and resources that are available. We need to remind our users about that. 
and to train librarians with uh, about the all the available tools that are out there and they can use in their work uh, in their training for for the their users but also for themselves and um, the role of libraries as providing a research support the, of, of academic libraries remains important and kind of proved to, to remain important even during COVID. And we think this will continue to, to remain important. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we move to Anka with the public libraries. Oh, come on, Claudia, you were too short. I mean, I, I didn't even... <laughs> <laughs> get to, to prepare so I'm just going to share my screen and uh, thanks again for the wonderful group that we had they were so talkative I felt like a human again thank you Lena for this opportunity you know uh, yeah yes it was such such a great conversation so uh, the public librarians very talkative and very open preoccupied a lot with the digital divide issues especially with the elder uh, elderly population and other vulnerable vulnerable, vulnerable uh, uh, populations. Um, um, the open science, which is not um, typically a public library question, um, better access for families who don't have the internet access and or uh, electronic devices to access the internet. So it's um, uh, technology and technology. <laughs> uh, so it's the heart and the uh, uh, connectivity issue. Um, that, that can become a barrier. Um, we need to expand services and resources in preferred languages other than English. So English is good, but we also have to, to make sure that we, we reach out to other um, um, uh, native uh, speakers. Equity, diversity, and inclusion training for library staff, which is necessary. Uh, technology training for staff, but uh, for, for patterns, but also for staff, because you cannot uh, help people if you don't know how to use the things that you need to help them with. So that's that's about it. And I'm so happy to, to have had the opportunity to, to um, talk to such a wonderful uh, uh, group of librarians. Thank you so much. Um, now we go to the school libraries group with Helen Chan and Sara Uroa. Okay, so... Um, for our group, um, we, we have a very small group, but we have a very happy and joyful, uh, fruitful discussion in our group. And then um, with Sarah and Rola, and then we, we um, have um, some points that we want to um, share with all of you uh, right now at, at this moment. And then uh, the first thing is we think about um, the hybrid collections, so especially um, um, Sarah, uh, who is really emphasized on the technology part, and she think about the e-books and e-resources um, and uh, uh, bandwidth problems, and then